All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. First of all, as I see people starting to tune in live via YouTube, I want to give a huge shout out uh, to everybody joining us from home, parents, students, educators. Normally, we'd be broadcasting live in the classrooms across North America, but through technology, it's so awesome that we can keep these events going uh, and we can still reach everybody in their home. So great to see everybody. Use the chat side, sidebar on the right. Let us know where you're watching from. And of course, send us in some questions for our guest, Kristen, today uh, when the time does come. So another thing I'd like to do today is give a big shout out to E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation Half Earth Education Ambassadors. So I'm sure that we have some tuning in today to check out Kristen's event. And I'm going to take a little moment to share a few slides just to introduce that program and some of the really cool work uh, that the foundation is doing. So just bear with me for a second. And let's take this uh, full screen. There we go. All right. So, oops. All right, Kristen, let me know. Does that, do you see presenter view or do you see nice and full screen? No, I think I muted Kristen. Kristen, give me a thumbs up if it's full screen. No? Let's try that. How about that? Is that full screen? No, okay. <laughs> I shouldn't have muted Kristen. Uh, uh, okay, let's try that one more time here. Not a great start with the technology. Sorry, Kristen, it didn't share properly. So let me try that share one more time. You're, I'm going to keep you on this time and you tell me if it went full screen properly. Okay, sounds good. Operating with me. I think it might have been full screen the first time. I okay. a little Let's different, see. but. How does it look? Um, it looks like the second way you had it before. So I think the first way you had it was good. Bam. Okay, there we go. There you go. So. Uh, all right, we've got a great quote from E.O. Wilson here. With biodiversity of our planet, map carefully and soon the bulk of the Earth's species, including ourselves, can be saved. So uh, if you want to do check out some of the Half Earth map, you can go to half-earthproject.org um, slash maps. And this is a really cool enhanced map project. So this has been redesigned. It's got a really cool navigation menu. It's easy to use. And it lets you explore things like species populations, uh, human pressures on those species, and then as well, current conservation uh, protections around the globe. So if we jump to the next slide, you can kind of see what this looks like here. So this is a view kind of looking at the Americas, and we kind of have all things switched on here. So you can see uh, biodiversity, uh, as well as existing protection overlaid, uh, and as well as the human uh, pressures layer uh, turned on. So definitely looks like a fun uh, program to check out look around the world and see where these kind of pockets of biodiversity are, where the protection is and where some of those human pressures are coming from. Now, uh, if you do become an education ambassador with uh, Half Earth, there is this awesome resource page for ambassadors. So you can see there's all kinds of lesson plans that you can use in your classroom. There's map design activities, uh, different PowerPoint uh, presentations to help support those. And then there's a really cool book, Nature's Best Hope. Um, that was released in February 2020 by Doug uh, Tallamy, and that kind of uh, expands on some of these arguments um, about uh, biodiversity and why it's so important to be protecting uh, these areas, especially areas owned by private uh, people. Lastly, I want to share this map of life. This is another real cool data um, partner of the foundation. And so this is actually showing some data of the bats that Kristen studies, the Mexican long nose. So you can see a little bit of observation uh, data there in Mexico. So this is some of the things that you can experiment with uh, and look at and use things like uh, the Half Earth map, also this map of life partner uh, to check out some data on species around the world. So lots of cool things going on with the E.O. Wilson uh, Biodiversity Foundation and any educators tuning in, you should definitely uh, sign up to become an ambassador and share some of these amazing biodiversity lessons and resources uh, with your students. All right. Let's bring things back here. Stop that share. There we go. So one thing that I should share is I've posted it in the side chat bar. 
if everyone would like to head over to Slido. So the link is there and then there's an event code and it's just BATS, so B-A-T-S. There is a poll question up there asking people about what they think about BATS. We'd love to see your answer. And then you can send in questions. You can upvote other people's questions as well. And then we'll have a live quiz after Kristen's event uh, to see how well everybody was paying attention today. All right, let's get down to business. Kristen Lear is a bat conservationist and environmental educator. She got her start in bat conservation at the age of 12 when she built and installed bat houses for her Girl Scout Silver Award project. Since then, she's traveled the world, including places like the United States, Australia, and Mexico, to learn how to protect endangered bats and to share her passion with the public. So Kristen, it's always a blast when we get to steal you for one of these events. We're excited to learn a little bit more about bats get to know you a little better. And of course, I bet there's gonna be a ton of questions for you. Absolutely, thank you for having me. And can you all hear me okay? Gotcha. So I'm super excited to be here today. Um, I know we're all kind of stuck at home right now with the current situation. So this is a great way to connect with everyone. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm gonna try something new today. Um, instead of sharing my screen with a PowerPoint, I actually have the slides embedded in the background of my Zoom. So we're gonna get to see some cool videos, um, some cool pictures of bats. Um, I do have some equipment to show how we actually study bats, and then we'll have lots of time for Q&A at the end. So welcome, uh, welcome to the world of bats. There are over 1400 species of bats around the world on every continent except Antarctica. So bats are everywhere. Um, and we can see here just a few of the 1400 species and there's a huge diversity of bats. Um, so I like these little ones up in the top left. We have the little um, white bats that are, they look kind of like little marshmallows or little cotton balls um, huddled all together. We have some of the fruit eating bats like the one in the top middle that, um, that eat fruit and they have these big eyes to see their fruit and see their prey. Uh, we have some of the nectar feeding bats down here that have some really long noses and they eat nectar from flowers. We have insect eating bats. Um, this really cool one on the bottom left is a Chapin's bat and it has this giant mohawk. So we can see a huge range of bats and there's everything from bats that have six foot wingspans, which are fruit eating bats and they only eat fruit, to the smallest bat, which is the bumblebee bat, which is about the size of your thumb tip. So we have a huge range, a huge diversity around the world. And like I said, bats eat a, a wide range of things, but one of the things that some bats eat are, is nectar from flowers. And I love this picture because we can actually see how some bats have a tongue that is one and a half times their body length to reach the nectar deep inside the flowers. We can see that tongue right there. And so if we had a tongue like that, that would be like having a tongue taller than we are. So these, these bats are well adapted to getting that nectar in the flower and they pollinate plants when they drink the nectar. So they get covered in pollen from the flower and then they spread that pollen all around to other flowers and help the flowers reproduce and help the plants stay healthy. Now, another group of bats, like I mentioned, eats fruit. And this one here has a fig in its mouth and we can see it shoving the fruit in its mouth. And then once it drinks the juice from the, the fruit, it'll spit the rest out or it'll poop the rest out. And what's in the rest of that fruit? Seeds. And those seeds grow into new plants. So bats are really important to regenerating places like tro tropical rainforests and helping regrow these areas that have been deforested. And then we have about 70% of bats. So the majority of bats eat insects. And this one here, this poor little moth about to get eaten. But that's good for us sometimes because some of these insects that the bats are eating are pest insects, things that destroy our agricultural crops. So sometimes these moths eat corn or cotton or pecans. So when we have these insect eating bats around, they help keep these pest populations under control and they save us money in the grocery store because farmers have to use fewer pesticides on their crops to help combat the insects. And also things like mosquitoes, right? So some bats do eat mosquitoes. So we like having them around outside to eat all those mosquitoes and keep us pest free. Unfortunately, um, around the world, bats are under threat. 
Um, about 12% of bats around the world are under threat of extinction or are threatened by things like habitat loss. So as we expand our, our development, we cut down trees, um, we disturb their natural habitat. Um, so this is one of the big, this is the biggest threat for bats around the world. Also persecution by people. Um, bats are very misunderstood a lot of times. And so um, sometimes people needlessly kill bats um, or try to get rid of them. And then also things like diseases like white nose syndrome here in the United States and North America, that is a fungus that grows on the bats and it just affects the bats, not people, but it kills the bats. And this is, this has wiped out over 6 million bats across the US and Canada since 2006. So we have all of these conservation threats to bats around the world. And so that's why as a bat conservationist, I work to study bats to figure out how we can protect them. And it's, I love my job. I we get to travel all over the world because like I said, bats are on every continent except Antarctica. And we get to see these cool bats and learn how to protect them. And so one of the things that um, I've gotten to do is build bat houses um, here in the US. So you can build bat houses and they, these are two different kinds of bat houses. The one on the right is kind of a, a standard typical bat house design. And then the one on the left is a rocket box. So you can see it looks kind of like a tree. And we build these different types of bat houses because different species or different types of bats like different bat houses. And that's what we were studying. And so we, get, we have this really cool video that we can see when the bats are in there, when they're coming out. And that means they have inhabited the houses. And you can see both of these houses are full of bats. So this was a really, uh, this was in Texas and a really exciting thing that we did build, building these bat houses. And these bat houses can hold up to 300 bats or so. So they, they like to be really tight inside there. And then we have some really cool cameras. So this is a, an infrared camera. So it's a special, has a special infrared light and then we use lamps. And so that's what this camera is here. And we set it up at the entrance or the uh, bat house um, at night. And then we can see, even when it's pitch black, we can see them coming out in slow motion. And here they come zooming out. And there they go. And they just kind of fall out. Like they, they fall out and then they fly away to go eat all those insects around, around the, the pecan orchards in Texas that we were working in. And then we have thermal imaging cameras, which I unfortunately don't have one here with me, but you can actually get one of these apps on your phone. It's a, one of the thermal imaging apps. And we can see the body heat of the bats and we can see them as they actually go up into the bat house. Can you see them latching on? They, they, they land and then they crawl up into the bat house for the day. And that's where they sleep during the day. And then we also can use infrared scopes. We have these tiny little cameras that fit up inside the bat house. And we can see them inside the bat house during the day. And you can see they like to be close together. They're very social animals. So they like to live in colonies, um, at least these ones do, and they like to be together. So with these cool technologies, we can see up close and personal the bats. Now, another thing that a lot of bat biologists get to do is of course, go into caves to look for bats. Um, a lot of bats do live in caves, not all of them, but a lot of them do. Um, and so this was in Australia, this was a cave of a critically endangered bat species. And so you get to crawl deep inside the cave through these little tiny cracks in the, in the cave, deep inside, and then we find this. So you can see, hundreds of bats. This is the critically endangered southern bentwing bat. And you can see there's hundreds of them. A lot of bat species can fit up to 100 bats per square foot. So that's like a, a regular tile on your kitchen floor. 100 bats could fit in that square foot. And again, that's because they like to keep warm. They like to be together and they're very social. Now, another thing that I've been doing more recently working with my PhD is in Mexico with pollinating bats. So these are some of those nectar feeding bats that I mentioned before. And we have two species here. We have in the white glove, we have the Mexican long-nosed bat, which is an endangered species. And the one being held in the yellow glove is the Mexican long-tongued bat. Now that seems counterintuitive because the, the long-tongued bat has a longer nose, 
um, but that's just how they're named and, and they both do have pretty long tongues. And they're both eating the nectar from agave flowers in Northeast Mexico and the US Southwest um, where I do my work in Mexico. And you can see these flowers, these are huge plants. Can you see the people down below? Those are, those are us. And you can see just how big these plants are and they're giving out tons of nectar for the bats. So as bat biologists, we get to stay up all night, which is what I love to do because I'm a night owl. And we get to stay out under the beautiful stars with, again, these cameras that we set up, the same cameras we use for the bat houses. We set them up in front of the agave, and then we can see them eating the nectar at night. And so these are the Mexican long-nosed bats, and they fly in groups. And you can see how they're swarming around and they're getting the nectar from the agave plants throughout the night. Pretty cool. And so these are this gray video here is from um, infrared binoculars or night vision binoculars. So they look, these are actual regular binoculars, but the ones, the infrared ones look just like this and that you can see in the pitch black of night without any light, you can see like this, kind of like in the, the horror movies with the, the night vision. And then with those infrared cameras, we can see close up the bats as they fly up to the nectar and drink it. And this is the Mexican long nosed bat and you can see it grabs on with its back feet and they kind of throw themselves onto the plant to get their face into the nectar. And we're basically trying to figure out what do they like about the agaves and can we plant more agaves to help protect these bats. And this one is the Mexican long tongued bat and you can see when it comes up, it's a little more delicate. It hovers a little bit better. It doesn't quite throw itself onto the flowers. And so, but again, both of these are, are drinking the nectar and they're both pollinating the, the flowers and helping the, the plants grow and stay healthy. And there he is, kind of hovering like a, like a little hummingbird. And I mentioned the long tongue. Well, you can see the long tongue here. Here it comes. Oh, there's the long tongue. It'll play again, but you can see just how long that tongue is. And he was sticking it out because he was trying to clean it. But can you imagine having a tongue that long? I sure cannot. <laughs> and I think one of the coolest things that we get to do as bat biologists is just see all these cool places with bats. If you ever get a chance to go to Bracken Cave or the Congress Avenue Bridge in Texas, please do because it is an amazing experience. Imagine just sitting out here being surrounded by this and watching these bats come out. These are Mexican free-tailed bats, and they, there are about 15 to 20 million of these bats in this cave. And they go out every night, they spread out across Texas, and they eat literally tons of pest insects that are destroying crops like corn and cotton. So again, these are, these are great animals to have around. And when we study them, um, we do get to get hands-on because we were studying them, but um, we always take precautions when we, when we handle bats. And I want to show you real quick, you can see this picture, we have a bat in a net, it's called a mist net. And I'm going to show you some of the stuff we actually use to catch bats and weigh and measure them. So I'm gonna go off of my screen and show you that mist net in person. So this is a mist net and it's basically like a kind of a giant hair net very thin fibers and we they're huge so they're like 30 feet long we string them up uh, where the bats are flying and the bats are flying so fast that they don't see them in time um, and so they they fly into them now i want to mention bats are not blind all bats have eyes and all bats can see just fine but when they're flying really fast they don't see this really fine net before they hit it so what happens is the bat a little toy bat for our demo bat flies into the net and it gets tangled. And then we get to take it out. And we always wear gloves because we want to protect the bats from anything that we could give them. And we want to protect ourselves from them too, um, just like any wild animal. So we put on our gloves, there we go. And then we take the bat very gently out of the mist net. And then we have them in our hand. And then we get to weigh and measure the bat and identify what species it is. Um, so what we do is usually you have a, a paper bag or some cloth bag, but right now I just have Ziplocs at home. So we put the little bat inside the bag and then we use a weight. So this is a, a scale, a hanging scale that you can see the measurements on. 
and we clip it to the bag. And then the bag's hanging and then we can read the measurement. So this bat's about 28 grams, which is a pretty healthy bat. So that's a nice healthy weight for a bat around here. And then we take it out of the bag and then we get to measure the forearm length. So we wanna measure that using caliper. So this is a special type of ruler that we basically open up and we measure the forearm. So that gives us a, a number and then we can use the weight and the forearm length to identify the species or what type of bat it is. And then the best part about doing this is we let them go. So we hold them up and they fly off your hand and off they go. So that's pretty, it's pretty easy. We are really quick when we process a bat. We don't wanna stress it out too much, um, but that's, that's how we do it. And then before we do q and I do want to show some specimens of bats. So these are some museum specimens. So they were collected back in the 90s, I believe. Um, so they're pretty old, but they're still hanging up there because um, they're from a museum. And this is one of the most common species across the US, the big brown bat. And now when I tell people big brown bat, they think, oh, it's a huge bat. But look, it's about less the size of my hand, smaller. So big brown is just because there's a little brown bat, which is littler. So it's not actually that big, um, but you can see it has fur. So all bats, bats are mammals, um, just like us. They have hair, they have fur. Um, we can see the tail here. So this tail poking out. And this is the membrane, the tail membrane right there. So kind of a thin, like kind of tissue paper consistency. And then we have the wing here and I can't open it because it's, it's dry, but um, I'll show you, this is a, a replica of a bat, what you would see if you could open it up. And you can see that the bat has its arm. And the coolest part is it has five fingers just like we do. So right here's the thumb. And then we have the first finger and the second finger are kind of connected. And then the third finger, your ring finger, and then the pinky. So the pinky is really long. So bats basically fly with their hand. And it would be like us having uh, fingers about four feet long. So a, a pretty cool feat for a bat. Now, another bat species is the Eastern red bat. And these are really common across the Eastern part of the US. Uh, here in Georgia where I live, for example. And you can see it's a little smaller than the big brown bat. Um, not too small, but the coolest part is that they actually have a lot of fur on their tail membrane. Can y'all see the fur compared to this one that's bare? And that's because big brown bats live inside places like inside trees or inside bat houses. Whereas Eastern red bats just hang from the tree leaves. They don't go inside the tree. So they're just hanging out in the leaves, in the rain, in the cold. And that means they have to stay warm which is why they have so much fur and they're really furry to help keep them warm when they're outside. And it's really cool, they, uh, they can, when they're hanging upside down, they can pull this tail membrane over their head and use it kind of like a blanket. So um, I've heard the term butt blanket to describe their little, little butt blanket, which is cool. And then one of my favorite bats is the Mexican free-tailed bat. So again, it's a small bat, very common throughout the Southern part of the US. And this is that bat that I was showing in the cave, coming out of the cave with 15 to 20 million. That's the Mexican free tail bat. And it's called a free tail because the tail sticks out from the tail membrane. You can see that here. And there's its five little toes. It has same, same five toes that we do. And I like this bat because it is the fastest animal flyer in the entire world. So a peregrine falcon can fly the fastest in a dive about 200 miles an hour diving, which is really fast. But this bat can fly the fastest in straight powered flight. Now, I know we can't really do guesses, but think of a number in your brain, how, how fast you think this bat can fly. Let's pull it back. Okay, they can fly about 100 miles an hour, which is nuts. This is faster than we drive. So the next time you're on the highway, you're going about 60, 65 miles an hour, these little tiny bats are flying faster than you are. So that's why this is one of my favorite bats. Um, and 
one last thing before I go, I do want to show a bat house because you saw the pictures um, of the bat houses, but I want to show one in person just so you can get a, a sense of how big they are. So this is a um, one of those standard bat houses um, and it's cut out here so you can see the inside. This would normally go all the way down, um, but it has the landing pad where the little bat is and that's where the bats land and crawl up into the bat house. And then you can see this one's a two chamber bat house. So it has two different rooms where the bats can crawl up and roost for the day. Um, and these are really easy to build. So um, I've helped kids build them. You can buy kits online that are pre-cut. All you have to do is assemble. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, pretty, they're really fun to make. So that's how big it is. So I wanna open it up for Q&A and make sure we have lots of time for Q&A. All right, that sounds good. Kristen, thank you so much for an awesome presentation. Really cool to have everything in the background like that. I yeah, like it was it. fun, like a weather, weather person. <laughs> exactly, awesome. Um, so I do wanna give a shout out to all the groups that are tuning in via YouTube. Lots of questions are coming in already, so keep them coming via YouTube. I also just posted the uh, Slido link one more time. So if you go to this link, the Slido, and then use the event code BATS, B-A-T-S, It'll bring you into a room where there's a poll question open right now. And then we're going to do a live quiz uh, in a few minutes after we take a few questions and see just how well uh, everybody was paying attention. But Kristen, I can give you our first report back here. Um, there was a question open. How do you feel about bats? And we gave people the option of love them, meh, and get them away from me. Yep. Only 5% of people said, get them away from me. So that's pretty good. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and 60% were right up there with loving them. So that's, that's, that's pretty good awesome. numbers, I think. Yeah, that is fantastic. Very cool. So uh, the quiz is open. If you want to sign up uh, for the quiz part right now, you just have to pop your name in. And then when the time comes, I will let you know when the quiz starts. So let's get some of those questions on the go. And Kristen, you and I kind of talked a little bit about this before, and there's kind of a little chat started here about yep. bats and the coronavirus. So people are wondering, you know, I'm sure there's lots of false information going around right now. What do, from what you know, what do we know so far? Yeah, so there's a lot that we still don't know. Um, there's a lot of research going on right now. Um, so we don't know exactly where it came from yet. Um, there is evidence that uh, bats and pangolins somehow are involved. Um, so I think the current thinking is that um, the bats could be the natural reservoir, and which means they, they host it without getting sick, and then that passing that along to some other intermediary host, um, which means an, an animal that would get it and then pass it on to a person. Um, there are other, again, I'm not a virologist, so um, I do want to caution that I, I, this is not my expertise. Um, but bats can host viruses and other things without getting sick, um, which is really important for us to study. And actually that might be useful for us in the future because if they can have things like these viruses without themselves getting sick, maybe we can learn something to develop tools or um, treatments for us to help us not get sick from viruses in the future. Um, so there's a lot of research going on right now and definitely um, things are changing every day, so. Yeah, keep up with it. All right, awesome. Uh, great, well, I'm glad to see that people are asking questions and are curious. So it was great to see a little discussion happening. Uh, let's give a few shout outs. So Sudbury, Ontario, San Francisco, uh, Pembroke, uh, Del Mar, California, Rockwood, Ontario, Elmville, uh, Peru and Chile, Colorado. Uh, let's see, Oshawa, Ontario. So we have lots of groups wow. joining Canada, the US. Uh, even from South America. So great to see so many awesome groups joining in. Let's get started. That's awesome. Uh, with a little Q&A action. All right. So first question from Pamela. How many, uh, how ma many young do bats usually have and how old do they have to be before they can have some young? That is a great question. I'm glad somebody asked that. So bats are, um, they're not rodents. They're not related to rodents, but they're about the same size as rodents. And rodents have, you know, litters. They have like 10 babies multiple times a year. Bats, on the other hand, only have one baby or pup per year, and that's it. They only reproduce once a year, and they have one baby. Some bats, like, um, like the eastern red bat here, this one, sometimes have twins or triplets, um, but for the most part, bats have one baby. 
And that's really important because if something happens to a colony of bats, it's going to take a long time for them to rebound their populations because they reproduce so slowly, which is why bat conservation is, is tough. Um, and as far as we know, for most bat species, they can reproduce in their, um, their second year after they're an adult. So they can start reproducing quickly, but they only have one baby a year. All Great right. Question. Great question. So Renita is wondering um, if bats can be found all across the US or is there areas that they're kind of more prone to be found in or, or live in? Yeah, so yes, they can be found all across the US. There's even bats in Alaska and Hawaii. So yes, they're in every state, um, but some areas do have higher numbers of bats. Um, so the Mexican free-tailed bat, the, the one I told you that flies the fastest, um, they tend to have really big numbers, huge colonies. So in Texas, they had the 15 to 20 million bats. Um, in Congress Avenue Bridge in Austin, there's about a million of these that roost in, under the bridge and it's a huge tourist attraction every year. Um, so yeah, so some areas have more bats than others, but there are bats all across the US. All right. So my friend Dennis from the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, he's tuning in right now and he's curious awesome. as to whether uh, different species will share the same bat box. Oh, yes, they can. So um, they tend to kind of segregate within the, the house or the cave where they're living um, because different species have different temperature requirements. Some like it higher up, some like it cooler. Uh, but yes, you can have multiple species in a bat box. Very All right, cool. very cool. Uh, Bernice is curious about what bats feed on. Do they all feed on nectar? Um, or does, is there some more variety? Yeah, there's more variety. So about 70% of bats eat insects. So the majority of bats around the world eat insects, um, but there's the nectar feeders, there's the fruit feeders, and there are even bats that eat meat. So they're carnivorous bats, which I think are super cool. Um, they eat things like rodents, frogs, other bats. Um, there's even a bat that go, some bats that go fishing and they catch fish from the water and eat them with their, they catch them with their back feet. Um, and there are three vampire bat species um, in the world, but out of only 14 or out of over 1400, there's only three vampire bats and they eat blood. Okay. Good question. Very cool. So Bonnie's curious about, do you ever analyze sound to detect which bats are in an area? Yes. Actually, that's a huge part of what bat biologists do is because we can't always catch bats and we don't always want to because we don't want to disturb them too much. Um, so another easy way to study bats is through echolocation. So through their sonar that the bats use. Um, and right here I have a, an acoustic detector. So this is an acoustic detector which picks up the bats echolocation calls and so that we can hear it. Um, and this is a really cool device because it's super small and it actually just plugs into your smartphone. So if you have uh, an Android or an iPhone, you just plug it in. And now you have a microphone on your phone and you can add, there's an app you can download um, and you can actually listen for the bats flying around. And we do um, use other bigger de acoustic detectors too to do long-term studies. So yes, that's a great question. All right, very cool. Uh, lots of great questions coming in via Slido as well. So let's grab a couple from there. Um, oh, this is a good one. So Amelia is six and Gabriella is 10. They're in southeastern Pennsylvania. And they're wondering, how can you tell what kind of bat house they should build in the area they live in? Another great question. You all have great questions. Um, so if there's a lot of great information online. Um, bat Conservation International has some really good information about putting up and building a bat house. But um, basically what you want to do is the more chambers, so the more rooms that the bat house has, like I showed, uh, the better. So the more chambers, the better. And where you are up in Pennsylvania, you're, you're gonna wanna paint your bat house a pretty dark color. Um, it can be like a, any color, but like dark gray, dark brown, because it's colder up there. And so you want to have the bat house absorb a lot of heat because uh, bats do like it pretty warm in the bat houses. Um, so yeah, you would want to put it in a good sunny spot. Um, the bat house, the flat bat houses um, are pretty good, um, but the rocket boxes are even better if you can, can build one of those. Great question. 
Right, very cool. Uh, let's see. So um, this is kind of an interesting question here. A few people are curious about what they eat affecting um, the bats. So one person's asking if insect eating bats are affected by pesticides and another is asking if a bat, so this is Jelly asking the second question, if a mosquito eats a, or a bat eats a mosquito that was carrying a disease, can the bat get that disease? Yeah, those are both great questions. So um, with the pesticides, yes, bats can definitely be affected. Um, we don't know a ton yet. It's just hard to study bats long term. Um, but we have found, for example, some bats, when the, the moms are uh, have their pup and they're feeding their pup the milk, there have been um, cases where the bat, the mom gets the pesticides in her body and then passes the pesticide onto the baby through her milk. Um, and again, we don't really know all the the effects of this, but it can definitely be bad for the bats. Um, so yes, that's why if you have a bat garden, um, using uh, organic practices, so not spraying pesticides is ideal if you can. Um, and then, yeah, the question about the mosquitoes. Yeah, um, that's a great question. That, that could definitely happen um, in certain cases. I don't know how common that is, um, but I, I could imagine that could happen. Great All right. Question. Oh, oh, and the second part was, oh, did you catch that little part at the end about the diseases? Yeah, so I, it okay. could happen. Um, yeah, not right. sure if we know for sure how, how often that happens. Perfect. So I shared the link one more time to the Slido. You have one question space to get in there. We're going to ask one more question before we start the quiz. So if you go to Slido, event code BATS, uh, and then join the quiz. So here we go. We have a lot of questions about handling the bats. This one is from EJ uh, and Isla, and they are wondering, have you been bitten while handling the bats? So yeah, bats, um, bats can bite just like any wild animal um, when you handle them because they're, they're afraid. Um, so that's why we wear gloves. And in addition to these, I always wear um, a thicker glove underneath these thin gloves. Um, and so those thick gloves basically protect us from getting bitten. Sometimes you can feel it biting you, but I've never had anything, any injury from that. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right, let's do it. Let's go to quiz time. So 20 seconds for each question. There's four questions. Uh, the quicker you answer the question, the higher your points will be. And then we will announce uh, the winners from there. So here we go. Quiz is starting. First question, how long can a bat's tongue be? Our options are one and a half times its body length, twice its body length, half its body length, or trick question, bats don't have tongues. Here we go, got about 10 seconds left. All right, everybody, well, not everybody, but the majority, 56% went with one and a half times their body length, and about 44% went with twice their body length, nobody thought that bats had no tongue. So people were definitely listening. So that's good. <laughs> good job on the first question. We're going to jump to the second question now and you will have 20 seconds on the clock. How many species of bats are in the world? So our options are 500, 350, over 1400, or a million. All right, nobody's going out oh, for the small numbers. A few going for a million, but overwhelmingly around just over 1,400 bat species. Good job, everybody. Next question. What is something bats don't eat or maybe don't eat often? So our options were nectar, fruit, insects, and bark. So Kristen definitely talked about uh, the things that bats love to eat. And let's see, five seconds left. and. Everybody is going for bark. <laughs> so good work. We had to think about it. And Kristen couldn't think of any bats that eat bark. We could be wrong. It could be wrong. <laughs> it does happen. It's probably very, very rare. So nectar, fruit, and insects are definitely more commonly uh, eaten by bats. Last question to take us home. It's a true and false. Can a bat eat its weight in insects in one night? So is that true or is that false? Can a bat eat its whole weight in insects uh, in one night? We've got about eight seconds left. 
All right, our time is up and overwhelmingly people think, yes, bats can eat their weight in insects in one night. That's pretty incredible. And you can see how important they can be, uh, especially if you have bats that live around your, your home as, as uh, natural pest control. And I, can I say something real quick? Yeah, go for it. About fun fact. So I like to put this in perspective. If you had to eat enough quarter pounder hamburgers to be like a bat in one night, how many would you have to eat? So I won't make you go through the math, but you'd have to eat between about 200 to 600 hamburgers in one night. So wow. bats are pretty darn amazing. Yeah. Good work, bats. All right. We have our top three. David, four out of four. He did in 32 seconds. William Carreri, four out of four in 36 seconds. And Amelia, six. And Gabriella, 10. Joining us in Pennsylvania, four out of four in 42 seconds. Good work. Uh, everybody. Awesome. Awesome job. All right. We have time. We can squeeze in another question or two. And there's so many good questions coming in, uh, Kristen, but yeah, I'm sure. Uh, let's see. There was one that I wanted to go back to, because I think it's a really good one, especially for all the students we have joining in today. We have David Burns tuning in with us and he mm -hmm. can tell that you love your job. I do. Uh, <laughs> and he wants to know, um, about the most important thing you did to help you achieve your goal of becoming a field biologist? Ooh. I think just being passionate. Um, so I, I got my start, my unofficial start in bat conservation in sixth grade, like Joe mentioned, um, when I built bat houses for a Girl Scout project. Um, and I, the, the bat houses I built were not the best. Um, I was still learning, but I think one of the best pieces of advice I can give is to just do it. Um, learn as you go and don't be afraid to do something that you've never done before because um, you never know where it may lead. All right. Great, great, great advice. Uh, let's see another interesting one from YouTube. Let's go down to the bottom and grab someone there. Um, okay. Here's a Canadian question. This is from <laughs> Karina. She's got her son with her, Emerson, and they live in Calgary, Alberta. And they're wondering in the summer, what kind of bats might be around uh, Calgary, Alberta, that kind of going up north like that? That's a good question. So there, there's fewer bats up in the north versus like um, Texas. Um, but the big brown bats, um, let me get that one back out, is pretty common. They are um, pretty widespread across the U.S. Um, but most of the bats up there are either the tree dwellers or the cave dwellers. So you'll see them flying around though in the, in the trees and also they can roost in the houses. So you might have houses, uh, bats around your house. I'd have to check the specific species, but feel free to uh, shoot me an email later or, or, or on uh, social media. All right. Question. Uh, let's see. So two questions about bat houses. One is from Pennsylvania. <coughs> From Valerie and she's wondering how high should the pole be if you have one that style and then Keila is wondering uh, what's the best reason for having one in your backyard so for the the height question um, they recommend at least 12 feet from the bottom of the bat house to the ground um, I like to say at least 15 feet basically the higher the better um, because the bats like you saw in those videos, they swoop out of the bat house and then fly off. So they need that room underneath the bat house to be able to swoop and take off. Um, so yeah, there's different recommendations, but I always put mine on 21 foot poles. There are these big metal poles. So that's pretty high up. Um, and then the, for having, the reasons for having bat houses, one is for you um, because they do help control pest insects, things like mosquitoes and gnats. They eat other things too, but um, if you have a garden, they can help control the, the garden moths that eat the, your garden. Um, so they help you. And then also having bat houses can help the bats. Um, if they, they're they losing their habitat, um, the bat houses can provide um, a, a stable, good habitat for them to, to roost in. Great All question. right, great questions. Um, we're gonna squeeze in one more question, but before we do that, I open up one final poll question. So we're gonna build a little word cloud here. Uh, if you can think of one word to describe Kristen's presentation today, um, that is open and let's see what words uh, come to the forefront in our word cloud. I do wanna remind everybody that we run five, six, seven, eight, 
of these events live every day with scientists, explorers, adventurers, conservationists, virtual field trips all around the world. So we hope to see your groups tuning in more. I put the link uh, in there as well. And take a minute and click that little mountain in the bottom right corner with the pants on top. That'll subscribe you to our YouTube channel and you'll get uh, little notifications and such when we do go live with uh, some of our exciting events. And you can find a library of hundreds and hundreds of events we've recorded in the past. So as that poll is open, I'll take one more question from Slido here. I'm just laughing at one of the responses. It's amazing with about 500 exclamation marks. So Yay. <laughs> enjoy the presentation. So I like this one. It's kind of a fun question. This is from Artie. Do fruit bats get cavities since fruit has so much sugar? <laughs> you know, that's a great question. I don't know. Um, I'd have to check if anybody's ever studied bat cavities. Um, I imagine that the fruit bats are pretty well adapted to eating fruit because that's their main food source. So I would think that they probably don't get a ton of cavities because they're used to eating fruit. Um, but I know, yeah, when I eat sugar, I get a lot of cavities. So that is a great question. Look that All up. All right, very cool. Well, let's see here. Flappy. But awesome. That's pretty cool. We've got some words being made up here. Uh, but we do have a lot of enthusiastic, interesting, awesome. Um, what else? Informative. Perfect. So there you go. You nailed it. Knocked it right out of the park. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so our groups tuning in today definitely enjoyed hanging out, learning awesome. about bats, and checking out all the cool videos and pictures and gear that you brought for us today, Kristen. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all. This is a, a nice break to the day. So thank you all for coming. All right. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in via YouTube. Thanks for all of those awesome questions. If you stick around uh, until 1230, I mean, go make some lunch, have a sandwich, whatever. Uh, but at 1230, we go live from the Toucan Rescue Ranch uh, in Costa Rica. And they rehabilitate all kinds of native wildlife like sloths and anteaters and armadillos and toucans and macaws and parrots. And today they're going to take us on a little behind the scenes tours to check out some of the birds, the toucans, the macaws, uh, the other parrot species, and who knows what else we'll see. So join us at 1230. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in and the amazing questions. And Kristen, thank you so much yeah. for today. That was awesome. Thank you all. And we look forward to another hangout. Hopefully if the weather gets warmer and we can get outside, it'll be fun to do an outside. All right. Bye. Thanks everyone.